Jesus in worship this morning. All right, our children are going to be dismissed right now at our children's worship time, so appreciate all those uh, that are helping out with that as they make their way out. The visual aid this morning is something every one of you have seen, uh, many of you probably handled, maybe even used before, or at least seen people that may have been using or not using it. So what, are, what, what, what is this? Oh, yeah, yeah, everybody got it. Nobody messed up. Nobody called it a hard hat or nothing silly. It's a, it's a helmet. What is it used for? It's used to protect your head while you ride a motorcycle just in case. It's just in case. It's like insurance. If you never crash, you never need it. If you never get in a wreck, you never need the insurance. But the law requires us to carry insurance for the reason of if we crash into someone else or whatever. Um, I've known many of folks living in Pennsylvania as well as Florida and a couple other states that there's no helmet law. While there's a seatbelt law, you've got to put a seatbelt on in a car that you're surrounded by all this metal. On a motorcycle, you don't have to wear a helmet if you don't want to. You can choose not to wear it. I don't quite understand that. We know it's a proven fact that falling over and hitting your head can cause you to die or give you a concussion, or give you brain damage, and yet it's okay to travel at 60 and 70, 80 mile an hour with no head protection, no, nothing protecting your head. Now, I ride with a lot of guys that they have no need. Look, they're too cool to wear a helmet. It's ridiculous to wear a helmet. Oh, pastor, I trust in God, and if I die, I die. Well, guess what? If you wreck, you're going to die. I remember the craziest thing I saw in Florida. I pulled up to the gas station, in Florida, you know, it's very hot. It's always hot. It's really, really hot all the time. And so you've got people that go to the beach all the time. Well, this guy drove up to, next to me on the gas pump, and he's got flip-flops. He's on a motorcycle. He's got flip-flops, shorts, and a motorcycle helmet. No shirt, shorts. I said short. No protection. And so I asked him, I said, so why are you wearing that helmet? He said, oh, I've got to protect my head, man. In case I wreck. And I said, let me tell you something, brother. If you crash, you're going to hope you don't survive. You probably should leave your helmet off because you're talking about a nightmare if you crash with no protection. Now, I was always look ridiculous and silly because in Florida, you know, it's 95, 100 degrees, and I've got long sleeve jacket on with pads in it. i got long pants on with pads in it. i got a helmet on and, and gloves, and, and usually I'm pouring sweat. That's why I love Pennsylvania. Well, I can ride most of the year without sweat. As a matter of fact, some of the year like I'm getting to now, you got to have that jacket on just for the warmth. I love it. This particular helmet has something inside of it. It's called a communicator. So I can actually connect to other motorcyclists and we can talk. Or in the case of many of you who have called me while I was riding from one point to the next, I can answer the phone and talk to you. Pray with you while I'm right. So it's got a communicator. Very important to be able to communicate different things to different places. I, 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 I love this particular helmet because it is there for protection if I need it. But it's also there to give me access to communicate with other people. And as much time as I spend on the bike traveling in so many different places, it's nice to be able to not miss a call and have 10 calls to, re, re, to recall people when I get to my destination. So now with that thought in mind, what book of the Bible have we been on Sunday morning? What, what are we in? We're in the book of Romans. And who is the author of the book of Romans? God is the author of the book of Romans. And who is the earthly man God chose to write through? God chose to write through Paul. That's right. Now we saw that uh, it was written to what group of people at what location? I mean, what location was it written to? Oh, the church at Rome. The believers at Rome that make up the church. Did Paul start that church? No. No. Paul, had he even been to that church? No, he had just heard about the church. He had heard about what was going on, and, and he had a desire to go to Rome. He had a desire to go and encourage those at Rome. He's going to eventually make it to Rome, but he's going to make it as a prisoner. While his heart was to go to encourage people of faith, his, his main direction was to go into areas that did not have churches and to establish churches by sharing Christ, people getting saved, and then coming together for a Bible study to learn the Word of God. And I believe he talked through like I do in an expository manner, but took the Old Testament to teach them what it meant about the Christ that was to come, the Messiah they were looking for in the fulfillment of Jesus. And so I believe he taught expository through all of the Word that they had at that time, training up leaders. And then when he had the place trained up, he would leave and go to another area that God would lay upon his heart and do the same process again. 
One of the greatest evangelists, one of the greatest church planters. But he's writing this letter, unlike many of his other letters, this is going to a church he had never been to, but he'd heard about their reputation. And he wanted them to have a systematic theology of what God had taught him in the time that he was studying God's word and being taught by God. So we get the first 11 chapters of Romans is all about what? Salvation starts with an S. All three of the words start with an S. Salvation, that's right. And we went through what particular road? It's the Roman road because all roads lead to Rome. In the earlier day, Rome had an incredible uh, empire and they wanted to make sure they could travel to every area. So they started at Rome and then made the roads go out to the different locations. That's why all the roads came to Rome because Rome spent so much money. Remember, we talked about their heavy taxation to build these roads, the heavy taxation to keep that uh, army employed, heavy taxation. We just thought we had taxation. They got heavy taxation. The Roman road started off in, in chapter 1, verse 16. I'm not ashamed of what? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God and salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then we go to Romans 3, 23. That's where a lot of people start their Roman road. But I like starting off with why we even share the word of God with people. Because you share what you're not ashamed of. I know people that should be ashamed of some of the sport team they support and, and, and root for because they've never won. But it don't matter. Their heart is in it. They support it. They are not ashamed of their team. They'll always think, maybe next year, maybe next year, maybe next year, maybe next year. That's their motto, you know, maybe next year. Then you got some that are always reigning at the top. And it's like, when are y'all going to quit doing that? When are you going to quit winning, you know? We are unashamed of those things we like and in invest in and believe in. If you believe in Jesus, you believe in his word, you should not be ashamed. So then we get to Romans 3, 23. And it tells us that we're all on the same playing level. It doesn't matter what our financial status is. It doesn't matter where we live at. It doesn't matter anything about our surroundings. It doesn't matter who our parents are. It doesn't matter who we are connected to. Because it says that all of us have what? All are sinners. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's it. We're all sinners. We're all even. And because we're all sinners, we're going to find out what that means. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, his standards no one lived up to it. Thousands and thousands of years to prove man could not live up to God's standard. So man can't stand before God and say, if you gave me a chance, I could have lived the perfect life. No, you can't. Thousands of thousands of years with millions of people proven no one could live up to God's standard. So the way the, the uh, all of Santa falls short of the glory of God. But the gift of God is what? Ah, see, it doesn't stop with the negative. The gift of God is eternal life. That is available to you through who? Jesus. Only through the relation with Jesus. He is the only way. He is the truth. He is the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. doesn't matter what man creates, what, what he idolizes, what he worships, what he says. No one can get to the Father except through the Son. Why? Because of what the Son has done for you and for me. We could not do it, yet he done it for us. So we move to uh, 5.8. Now chapter 5.8, it tells us that because of God's love for us, God demonstrated his love for us by allowing his Son to die for you and for me. Isn't that amazing? That he loved you enough. He demonstrated his love. Now we are asked the whole entire time that we live for Christ to demonstrate our love for him. If we demonstrate our love for him... It's going to cause us to get out of our comfort zone. It's going to cause us to do some things that we probably never thought we'd ever do. Uh, I can tell you what, I never, ever, ever thought I'd be preaching the word of God. I never thought I'd be standing in front of people. I never thought I'd be speaking publicly ever because that was not who I was. And when God called me, I'm like, are you kidding me? Don't you have the wrong person? Are you calling the wrong number? I mean, something behind the scenes, running sound, anything, but not publicly speaking in front of people. I want to be in the back quietly hidden away. He said, yeah, that's right. That's why I want you to give in front. And that way you will let me use you. And I remember the first time I, I studied to preach the word. I mean, I studied and studied and studied. And I got up there from memory and trying to remember every word that I said. And I had to get every word or I'd get off track and wouldn't be able to do it. And I practiced it hundreds of times. And I thought, man, if I just lose my concentration from one moment, I'm going to mess up and have to start the message all over. So if I preach for 20 minutes and I get to the last five minutes and mess up, i got to go all the way back to the beginning. 
Now, of course, if I would have told the people that, they probably prayed that I wouldn't forget. Praise the Lord, I preached that thing up to trees and to the animals out in the backyard. I went up in the woods and preached. I preached it a hundred times. And then I got in front of the people and said, oh my goodness. Y'all some scary looking people. I said, Lord, please don't let me see them. You know, I've heard people say, hey, if you want to keep your concentration, just pretend people naked. That's the stupidest thing I ever heard. I don't see nobody naked. I'm like, no, Lord, help me not to see anybody. And, and, and you know what happens is when you're preaching the word, you see the word, you don't see the people. That's why when you get to move around, so I, I don't know that. I, I, so I said, oh, did you hear this? Did you hear that? No, no I, didn't, I didn't hear that. You know, I'm focused on the word of God. That's all I can see. I make my eyes look around to pretend that I'm looking at you trying to catch you sleeping or something. I'm not really seeing what I'm looking at because in my mind, I'm seeing the word of God that I've just glanced at, that I've just focused on. That's what God wants from all of us is to keep our eyes focused on him, focused on his work, focused on his direction. And you'll be amazed at what he'll do. Paul, I think, understood that. Uh, a matter of fact, I got the idea from Paul because, you know, Paul, when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, what happened to him? He was blinded by the bright light of who Jesus is. He could not see, and they had to guide him all the way to where they were going. Now, we understand most likely, as Paul was praying for God to remove the thorn in the flesh, most likely it was his eyesight. Most likely he couldn't see. The stuff that we have that he penned was written really large because he probably could not see very well because he encountered the glory of God through Christ's appearance on the road to Damascus and he was never the same afterwards. And God said to him when he asked for, for that to be taken away from him, that thorn in the flesh, that, hey, when you're weak, that's when I'm made strong. So oftentimes we pray for our weaknesses to be removed and God says no because in your weakness I can be your strength. And when you rely on me for your strength, you'll see, understand, feel power like you've never understood before. So when we're weak, instead of having a pity party, we should be saying, God, you showing up? It's your turn. I'm weak. I can't do it. I need you. I need you bad. You know, save me. Help me. And guess what? If you mean it with your heart, he's going to show up every time. He's going to help you through it. Sometimes we don't see it or understand it while we're experiencing it. And afterwards, when we look back on it, we say, he was there the whole time. I just didn't even realize it because I was too blind and I couldn't see him. I believe Paul not being able to see very well when he studied the word of God, when he understood the word of God, he had the word of God memorized that when he preached, when he shared, when he evangelized, that's what he saw in his eyes. The words of God speaking to him in his ears as well as his eyes so that God could use his mouth. To reach those people. So we go from uh, talking about we're not ashamed of the gospel. Talking about all of sin. Talking about God demonstrated his love. Then we get to why God demonstrated his love. When we get to chapter 6 verse 23. It says the payment or the reward. What is the wages of sin? Death. Eternal death. Separated from God forever. For the wages of sin. Is death. But the gift of God. There it is again. Eternal life. Always focus on the eternal side of things. Death or life. We were created and we were designed to live forever. And we will live forever. Every person will live forever. We just decide in our time on this earth where we will spend that eternity. We will receive a glorified body and live eternally. Or we'll receive a body that's immortal and live eternally separated from God. So we'll live in eternal life or we'll live in eternal death. We choose because God loves us and says, I created you in my image. You choose where you want to spend your eternity. This is what I have for you. This is the blessings I want to give to you. But you've got to accept it and go after it. Because this is where you're going to go because the wages of sin is death, eternal death, separated from God. But I love you. Send my son to die for you so that you can come over here and live with us forever in the place I designed for you. See, God didn't design eternal death for us. He didn't design the lake of fire for us. He designed it for the enemy of God. But all who reject him are going to be going with him because there's always got to be judgment. And if we didn't have free will to choose, then it wouldn't be much good. Would it? But we're made in his image, the ability to think, reason, and choose where we'll spend eternity then we get to a person says, okay, I'm a sinner, condemned, unclean. The waste of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. How do I get that eternal life? Well, we continue on to chapter 10, verse 9. And it says that we do what? Confess, Confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in our hearts. So we're confessing what we believe, that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All. It doesn't say all who attend church. 
It didn't say all who give money to the church. It didn't say all who are baptized. It didn't say all who do anything except believe with your heart. You confess what you believe with your mouth. You believe with your heart. You confess. We get to chapter 12. Chapter 11, 1 through 11 was all about salvation. Anybody remember what chapter 12 was about? About sacrifice. That's right. First, your body. Living sacrifice. Very important. It don't belong to you. It was bought with a prize. It belongs to the Lord. It is to be used to honor the Lord. So we are a living sacrifice. If it wasn't hard to do, it wouldn't be a sacrifice. A sacrifice means we have to dig deep. We have to give up some of our time. We have to give up some of our finances. We have to give up some of our talent to honor the Lord with because he blessed us with it anyway. Therefore, we are a living sacrifice. Living means that we have to do it every day because we can get selfish and take ourselves down off that altar and go throw a pity party and do what we want to do. Then we're not a living sacrifice. Then we're a bad example. <laughs> living sacrifice daily taking up our crossing and following him. Not only our bodies, but also we present what to him? Our mind by renewing it. How do we renew it? By being in God's word. You cannot renew your mind and have a mind of Christ if you're not in God's word. How often are we to be in God's word? Every single day is a gift from God. Every single day draws you closer to his presence. Every single day you should be in his word, personally and privately, studying and asking God, how does this apply to my life? And then let me live it out in my life so I'm a doer of your word, not just a hearer only. It's not a suggestion, folks. I'm heartbroken when I meet people that claim to be a Christian for 30 years and yet they don't have a good walk with Christ. They don't know about how to pray. They don't know how to fast. They don't know how to spend time with God. That's heartbreaking to me because you don't have an intimate relationship with God. And yet you can meet some people that have lived crazy, wild lives. They get saved and they are in the Word of God. They'll read the Word of God for hours and be uh, blessed by God tremendously. And when you look at their relationship, they're talking and hearing from God. Why? Because they have taken their walk with him seriously because they knew where they were and what they had done and that God forgave them for that. And they get excited about it. As they read, they can't help but get captivated by the words they're reading, seeing it in their mind's eye, lived out before them and understanding the struggles that the early disciples went through and understanding what Jesus did for them. They can't help but to be excited. I don't know any believer who really would take time to study God's word that can't be excited. If you're here watching or listening and you have not ever been excited about reading God's word, you need to call me, email me, or message me because there's a problem. It goes back to whether or not you're really saved. Because see, if you're saved, you're born again, blood washed, spirit baptized, the spirit inside of you can't help but to get you excited about God's eternal word that's talking about his eternal destiny for you, his love for you. you can, I can't help but get excited. It makes me passionate. And when I get passionate, I want to tell everybody. It's not a secret for us to maintain. It's something for us to share. So a living sacrifice of our body, a living sacrifice of our mind, and a living sacrifice of our heart heart. If you love something with all of your heart, you talk to others about it. I don't know any boyfriend and girlfriend that are not caught up in this thing they call love. That ain't telling you every single time you see them about the other person. Sometimes it can make you sick. Working with teenagers for 18 years, I used to say, I don't want to know. Quit telling me. I don't want to hear that name again. You know, Lord, please help me to protect my ears. It's killing me. But we, when we are in love, we talk about what we're in love with. You know what's amazing? Is I could spend time with any of your kids that are, you know, say, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And I can tell you what you love by listening to them. I used to hear my pastor growing up say that. And I'd say, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. And then I had kids. See, kids don't automatically just lie. They just tell the truth. And so you give me your kids for a little bit of time. And I can find out all about your whole entire life. Kids will tell the truth. And I don't have to ask them. I just listen to them. Sometimes we don't listen to people. Yeah. Mind, body, and heart 
Then we got to chapter 13. Remember chapter 13? That was that challenging chapter. The first seven verses was nobody really likes. It's a, it's a lot of controversy and everything. And, and, and it, it talks about doing what? It starts with an S? Submit. Submission. That's right. Submit to the government. Well, we don't really like that. But it says it in there. And we are to follow it because God put them people in that position. Whether you like it or not, therefore, to submit to them is submitting to God. And then the last. That was only seven verses. And then the last rest of the chapter was all about God's love. Our submission to him, demonstrating our love for him by reaching out to others. Outside of the church, inside of the church, loving one another. Then we got to chapter 14. Chapter 14 is about the believers, the Christian. Remember, we led somebody down the Roman road. They got saved in chapter 10. And then we get to chapter 12 about sacrifice. We get to chapter 13 about submission. Then we get to chapter 14, and it's about service, our duty, our responsibility, our service for God, to God, because of God. Now, that caused some little bit of ruffled feathers there too because it's not theological issues that he's dealing with. It's what we call the gray area. Because everybody wants to say, well, the Bible doesn't say about this. The Bible doesn't say about that. The Bible doesn't tell me. Well, you know what it does do? It gives you the Spirit of God living inside of you to bring conviction in your life to tell you whether something is right or wrong for you and therefore you are to live it out. Now, it has nothing to do with saying a sin is okay. God will never allow his spirit inside of you to tell you that it's okay to get into any kind of thing that's sin. He's not going to say, because you prayed about it and you didn't feel bad, it was okay for you to steal what belonged to your neighbor. No, he's not going to do that because he already said, you shall not steal. He's not going to give you permission through your conviction to do something wrong. The Bible says it's wrong, it's wrong, therefore we do not do it. Now we know there's people born with an issue called kleptomania. They can't help but to steal. It's, it's in their nature. They just can't hardly stop from taking something. And it doesn't have to be valuable. It's just the idea of taking it. And what do we tell them as a society and a government? <laughs> you do that, and what's going to happen? You're going to get in trouble. You might go to jail, pay a fine. <laughs> we cannot use conviction personally to justify sin that God's already declared wrong. It doesn't matter if you think you have a desire for this or that. The person that's born a kleptomania has to control that which is wrong in a sin against God by asking the Spirit of God to give him power and encouragement through it to overcome it. Ah. And then we got chapter 12 through 15. Chapter 12 through 15 is going to deal with our heavenly citizenship as we live it out on earth. Why do we do things that we shouldn't do? Why do we tell others to do things that we think is right and that we think they're wrong? Because of our depravity, because of our misery, and we want them to conform to us. And then we find out in Romans 14 that Romans 14, I want you to understand this. I will say it one more time, and then I will say it probably at the end. Romans 14 is not about allowing any issue to create. I mean, it is all about not allowing any issue to divide the church. It is for believers, and when I say the church, I'm not talking about Chambers or Baptist Church. I'm talking about God's church, which includes all denominations all around the whole entire world who agree that there's only one way to salvation, and that's through Christ. We are talking about don't cause divisions from within. Now, theological divisions is what separates us as denominations. That's okay. It's okay because a church over here is a different denomination. They believe something a little bit different than we do about theological issues, but they're reaching a group of people. We don't agree with them on that issue, but we're reaching a group of people. They don't agree with us on this issue, but they're reaching a group of people. That's okay. That's theological differences that is still uh, uh, hard to, it's all in how you define what the scriptures say. That's why I preach expository and don't bounce around. Because people who bounce around, I think, misunderstand scripture and allow the scripture to say something that they really wanted to say when they don't. Yeah, that's why you have to be careful to make sure you're making sure everything is within the context and not out of context. So it's not about, uh, I mean, it's all about not creating division within the church. We don't have to all agree on everything, but we do have to do one thing with each other. You know what that is? L-O-V-E, that's right. Love one another. We have to. That's not, that's not a recommendation. It's an expectation. God says, I loved you when you was a sinner condemned unclean, <laughs> full of nastiness, but I loved you. And then you got saved. Therefore, you are to love one another. Even in the differences, you are to still love them. Let them live their life. You live your life. God will be the judge when they stand before him. We are not the judge. Don't get yourself in a position thinking you've got to judge everybody because that's what religious people do. 
We're not religious people. We should never be religious people. We are all about a relationship with God that we want to get closer and more intimate with. Not because of a bunch of do's and don'ts, but because we love him because he loved us. Uh, there we get to the message this morning. If you've got your Bibles open to Romans, we're in chapter 14. We're going to start in chapter, I mean, verse 14. So it's Romans 14, verse 14. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for what you've got in store for us. We pray that you'll help us to block out distractions. We thank you for our technology that we can record the message and put it online. We pray that that works well. We thank you for Facebook and those that are tuning in to Facebook Live. We pray that works well so that people can hear your word, Father, and that your word will speak to their heart and their heart will be drawn close to you. We thank you for loving us. Help us to love you. For we do ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at verse 14. It says, I know, uh, I know and am convinced by who? Very important for you to understand that this is not Paul's perspective uh, uh, personally. He says, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing what? There's nothing unclean of itself. That word unclean means to be common. And it's referring to things that were prohibited by Jewish ceremonial law. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee. He abided by the ceremonial law requirements. And now he's saying, oh, there's nothing unclean about it. So, you know, that pork that they used to avoid, they didn't want to eat, but Paul said, it's okay. And I'm sure it went against every grain in his body. <laughs> it says that, that I know there's nothing unclean in and of itself. Sounds like you can make anything okay and right from your perspective. But remember, some things are inherently wrong because Scripture calls them a sin. But the gray areas, what are they? They're the pet peeves of some people and the pet peeves of some churches. It's about what do you feel about alcohol, about food, about the holy day, uh, which day of the week you worship, about tattoos, about movies, about music. Yeah, these are preferences. But you've got to understand what you think is right is right for you may not be right for someone else. Now, again, when I talk about sin, we ain't justifying sin. We're talking about gray areas. Uh -huh. Look what the last part of verse 14 says. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it's what? If he declares it to be unclean for himself, his convictions say that it's unclean, then it is wrong for him to eat of that meat. It is wrong for him to engage in that kind of activity. Our convictions can make okay things into sin. But we've got to make sure that we never make sin okay. Because our natural instinct as human in the flesh is to justify sin because we like it. It tastes good. It looks good. It feels good. We want to do it. We want to partake of it. We want to enjoy it. And that's not what God says. We are to make sure as the strong believer. Remember, we talked about the strong and the weak. Which one are you? I bet most of us would say, oh, I'm a strong believer. I study the word of God. I live out these principles. I obey this and obey that. Well, you may find out you may be the weak. You may be the weaker. Because, see, those who give in to religion and a bunch of do's and don'ts are the weaker. And I told you that I, I personally found out, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm the weaker in, in a couple areas. Understand that Paul was the weaker of faith in some areas as well. Why? Because of his religious background in Phariseeism that said this is wrong and nobody should partake of it. Uh, we say alcohol is wrong and nobody should partake of it. The Bible does not say that. But we as people say that. Now, I'm not talking about pastors and deacons because the Bible clearly says we are not to partake of. But I'm talking about individual believers who get saved. It doesn't say you have to abstain from alcohol. Now, I'm not justifying alcohol because personally, I'm weak in the faith. I don't believe you need any of it at all, ever. Because if you need to dull your senses, there's a problem. And it begins with a relationship with God. Because if you've got a good relationship with God, no matter how hard a situation is, He will see you through it because when you are weak, He is made strong. Personally. I think it uh, all wrong. I worked in a drug and alcohol rehab center. I've seen the damage it does. Therefore, because my family have a long history of addiction, I'm not even going to partake of any of it. None of it. At all. Because I know my addicted uh, tendencies would probably just be overwhelmed and I won't be able to stop. So why start? Praise the Lord, I did not get influenced by people to start smoking at a younger age. I didn't get influenced by people to start doing these things at a younger age. Because then I, I see friends of mine who have spent years trying to stop a habit, an addiction that they should have never started. God tells us to be careful. He tells us to watch out. And he tells us never to overindulge. Eating too much food, let me tell you, that's a sin against God. 
Because he says, don't be a glutton. It's tough, though. It tastes so good. And it looks so good. And I want more. And I want more. And I want more. Yeah, I know. We've got to be careful. got to be careful. He touches on everything. Tattoos. John, you want to go to tattoos? Look, y'all saw John up there being worship morning. Got tattoos all over the place. Uh, we're going to get there. Hold on, John. We'll get there a little bit later. All right. John, begin a message ready to rebuttal what I'm going to say. No, I'm just kidding. You're not. <laughs> If it's unclean to you in your prayer life, then it is unclean for you. Do not partake of, do not participate, do not engage in. We get to verse 15, look what it says. Yet if your brother, now remember we're talking about weak and strong. If your brother is grieved because of the food that you have the freedom to eat, uh, you are no longer walking in what? Love. Ah, so here it is. You feel freedom to eat whatever meat you want. It doesn't matter if it was sacrificed to an idol and put out on the marketplace and was cheaper meat. You went, you buy, you're like, hey, false gods don't even exist. It's as if they're dedicated to nothing and no one. Therefore, I have the freedom to eat it. I'm going to eat it. It's going to taste good. I'm okay with that. But your brother over here who's weaker, who lives in a religious uh, framework, says, no, 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 never eat anything offered to idols. It's bad. It's wrong. It's in, it's in encouraging them to make these sacrifices to these idols. Oh, see, the, see the differences? Which one's right and which one's wrong? Neither one of them. This one is saying, no, don't eat. Therefore, he should not eat. This one over here says, oh, no, it's fine. It's okay. I can eat. Okay, you can eat. The problem comes in with the stronger in faith tells the weaker in faith, I'm right, you're wrong. You're going to watch me indulge because of my freedom that liberty brings me. Now you've gone from no sin into sin because you're flaunting it, but you're tempting it. You have become the tempter because now he's over here saying, well, if he's going to eat and he's a strong believer, maybe I should eat. But if they believe it's wrong, then they do not need to partake of it at all. Look what he says. He says you're no longer being walking or being guided in love. He says, it, yet if your brother is grieved because of the food you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Do not do what? Do not destroy, do not destroy with food the one for whom Christ died. In other words, don't cause this brother to stumble and fall and get mad at God because of your freedom in Christ. What does that, what is, what is that look like? Paul, Paul is building on a principle of conviction. If you've prayed about it and you feel that it's wrong, then follow your conviction with the principle of consideration. So he's saying, okay, your conviction says it's okay for you. His conviction said it's not okay for him. Therefore, you, in your consideration for love for your brother, don't cause him to stumble by eating it in front of him and flaunting it in his face because it's wrong. Now, we, we, we're talking about food, but it also goes with alcohol. You go out to eat. You got a, fa a full of people. You got 9, 15, 20 people there, and, and a few of them want to drink alcohol. But, oh, no, no, I believe it never drinks alcohol. Never, ever, ever. I can't stand for that. I can't believe in that. Then the brother who says that, no, it's okay. I'm not going to get drunk. I'm just going to drink because I like the flavor. I'm only going to have one. He is to be, if he's stronger, he needs to say, no, I'm not going to have any today because it would be offensive to my brother. And I don't want to make my brother stumble. Now, me personally, I eat with a lot of people that drink alcohol. Don't bother me one bit. My conviction is I'm not touching the stuff, not having it in my house. You ain't coming to my house and drinking it. No, because that's my rules. That's my property. And that's my convictions. But if I'm at... You a place to eat or whatever you want. I'm a, it doesn't bother, me. doesn't bother me. Now, if you get drunk, it's going to bother me. But to drink one with your drink, I'm, I'm okay with that. But a brother who's not okay with that, as a brother who cares for them, we are not to partake in. I know some of you are getting upset about that. I'll get some emails. That's okay. The Bible is very clear. You, you, you think I'm wrong. You study the word of God and prove that I'm not teaching truth. This is the truth from Paul. He's dealing with topics of the day that was very important because of people's indulgence in the communion and indulgement in their wine, getting drunk and eating gluttonous, and he was attacking all of it. Remember, I told you, Paul, he started off the letter offending people. He didn't stop. He's offending the lost. He's offending the religious. He offends everybody. Why? Because he's preaching the word of God that is not popular at that time. And believe me, a lot of what he taught and preached is not popular today. And it's going to continue to get less popular. Why? Because he stands on the side of truth. And when man would rather believe a lie than the truth, they will cast stones at the truth over and over. He continues on. Verse 15. Look at it again. 
Yet if your brother is grieved because of food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Ah, we've already talked about that. Go to verse 16. It says, therefore, do not let your good. What is your good? Your good is what you as a believer consider to be okay. Uh, do not let your good be spoken of as what? Oh, can you believe what that person did? Man, they serve some meat. They serve the they ate that. See there? Now you got a rumor meal going. You got people saying, what? They did what? Paul said, what? Oh, mercy. Did, did, oh, nothing about the alcohol. We can drink alcohol. Okay, let's go get drunk. No, no. See, we go from saying something's okay to justifying sin. We have to be very careful. There is a right and a wrong. In the middle where the gray is, we need to be careful that our convictions will speak to our heart. We need to follow them. Do not cause your freedom. Do not let your freedom, a good, uh, a good thing, become reviled against someone you care about. It is not a license to sin nor flaunt in the face of others you care about. Those who are mature, there you go, doesn't have anything to do with your age. I know some of you older ones saying, that's me, I'm mature. No, I'm not talking about your age. I'm talking about in Christ. Those who are mature and have liberty are the ones to whom you are told, you are instructed. To change your behavior in the presence of a, a, a weaker brother. The weaker brother is never, never, ever, never told to accept what the stronger believer believes. Huh. So it says the mature, the strong believer, the one strong in faith. You are to have the reins to control yourself. Now, I know most of you know that I shot pool, billiards, years ago. Did a lot of billiard shooting. As a matter of fact, uh, I was paid by a guy to lose. And I was giving money to lose. And I loved it. You know why? Because I could be the better player and I could make you beat me and you thought you was dynamite and you were nothing. Mm -hmm. All I was doing was setting you up, filling you out, finding out what you could do and what you couldn't do. And then the person that I worked with would come along and take every penny in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to be encouraging you along the way to get a little more drink in you. I'm going to encourage you along the way. If you happen to have a good streak and you got your wife or girlfriend sitting by you, I'd go and flirt with them to get them all to get you mad and riled up. Why? Because the number one goal is to cause you to lose every penny in your pocket. And it's sad to say, I mean, it breaks my heart that I was very good at it. Paul is trying to tell us that if you're stronger in the faith, then you restrain yourself. I was better at pool, but I would let others think they were. So if any of you come to my house and play pool, if you beat me, I'm like, okay, you're good. Moving right along. Get to verse 17. Look what it says. The kingdom of God, that's what we want. We want to desire our eternal life that is in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not about what? It's not about arguing about what's right in eating and what's right about drinking. It's Here it is, though. While it's not about those things specifically, it's not about external things like the food. It's about spiritual realities. What are the spiritual realities that Paul wants us to understand that the kingdom of God is like? The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but instead, number one, it's what? Righteousness. That's not only our action, but it's our thoughts. Righteousness. What's number two? Peace. Peace. That's talking about unity. That it is us who seeks harmony with those within the fellowship and those without of the fellowship. Now, that's talking about the lost people. Now, remember, Paul already said in chapter 13, be at peace with everyone as much as you can. But that doesn't mean to be a doormat, to be walked on, treated poorly, and put down because you love Jesus. As a matter of fact, I would go against that because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God lives in you, and you should not let anybody walk on the Spirit of God. <laughs> You stand up for him. You live for him. As a matter of fact, other places Paul's going to tell the stronger brother in faith, if you see the weaker being picked on, your responsibility is to go stand with them, beside them, and encourage them, and be the mouthpiece for them. Yeah, so that puts, puts to shame that mentality lost people have that Christians are to be abused and we should take it. Turn the other cheek. That ain't what that turn the other cheek means. Uh, if a guy asks you for your cloak, give him not only your cloak, but also your, your, your wardrobe, whatever you have. No. That's a different speech. See, that's what happens when people take things out of context. They make the Bible say things it doesn't say. We are to live for Christ, stand up for Christ, honor Christ, and all that we say, all that we do, how we behave is to reflect our love for God and our love for others, being at peace as much as we have the privilege of making it peace. Some people you can't have peace with. 
Uh, they follow their father, the Satan, and he is the one who wants to destroy peace. And they worship him. They love him. And they're going to bring that chaos into your life. Jesus is the one who brought peace. Matter of fact, he tells us he gives us peace that surpasses all understanding. That in the midst of a storm, a tragedy, a difficult situation, he can give us peace that comes from loving him. A joy that comes from our salvation. So they want to bring in that garbage. You stand firm. Say, okay, Lord, you take care of this. And let me tell you, when you tell the Lord, you tell him, ask him, give him permission to take care of your situation. He'll do it in a way you could not ever do it. Truth will be made known. So here, the kingdom of God. First, it's like uh, it has to do with righteousness. Second is uh, peace. What's third? Joy. Joy. There you go. That comes from our relationship with God. It's available to all of us because of the redemptive work of the Son through what is indwelling us, which is the next part, in the Holy Spirit. Those who understand the spiritual realities of the kingdom will not choose, will not choose brief joy over long-term joy. We're not going to flaunt what we think is okay in front of the face of someone else as, as, as spite. That's short-term joy. I, I showed him. I showed him, didn't I? No, you didn't. You engaged in sin. Now you have to ask forgiveness of that. And let me tell you, now your pride is going to stand in your way because you say, no, it's okay for me. No, no. You've given in to sin because you've made what was right for you and wrong for someone else. You've flaunted it in their face, and now it's become sin to you. I'll never forget an evangelist that I thought was one of the greatest evangelists I've ever listened to. He talked about uh, being at a bus stop and had an abusive uh, life growing up. He was 9 or 10 years old being beaten by his parents. And, and he life wasn't worth living, but he had to go to school. The only place he could get escape. And he remembered that this little boy come up to the bus stop about 7 or 8 years old crying his eyes out because he just got yelled at, at from, from his parents about something ridiculous. And that boy that was older said, here, take this. And he took a weed out of his mouth and gave it to the boy. And the boy smoked it. And he felt good. He smoked it again a little bit later. It became a habit because this boy had been in an abusive situation. He was smoking it every day. That little boy OD'd and died. The older boy didn't care. Now I will tell you the long story. That older boy is spoken to by God. In the midst of his terrible life situation of abuse, he came to the realization that he will stand before God alone. And he cannot blame his parents. He cannot blame his neighbors. He will stand before God and give an account of what he had done. He invited Christ into his heart and became the greatest evangelist I've ever heard. But his life wasn't always like that. We have to be careful what we think is okay and what we think is good that will hurt someone else. And that was outside of the church before salvation. That little boy that died has haunted him all of his life because he knew he was the cause. He did it. How many times do we look back in our Christian walk and say, you know, I caused this brother or sister not to go to church anymore because of something I said or something I did. Then you need to ask God to forgive you. You need to go to them and ask forgiveness. We've got a lot of people that live at home that don't go to church and they blame it on a situation at a church. Now that doesn't make an excuse. God's still going to hold them accountable because it's a, if someone gets hurt at a church, that's a poor representative of Christ. They need to go to another church. They need to go to another church. And if that don't work for them, they need to go to another church. They need to go to another church until they find where God can use their gifts at through that church. They don't just quit God. And that's what happens. A lot of people, they just quit God. They just use it as an excuse not to go anymore. Guess what? People are doing that with COVID. They're not wearing it anymore. That's what, now we have division in the church. We'll wear a mask, not wear a mask. Get the vaccine. Don't get the vaccine. Not big arguments. We never thought it would happen. But it's there. And it's going to continue to get worse and worse and worse. God tells us, don't side either or. Pray. Whatever God leads you into conviction, you follow after. The kingdom of God is made up of righteousness, peace, joy, as the Spirit lives inside of us to give us not brief joy, but spiritual joy that will last forever. Look at verse 18. For he who serves Christ in these things is what? Yes. Number one, acceptable to God. Isn't that what you want all of your life? To live it, to honor God, to be acceptable before God. So when you stand before him, he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well, are you living for him? Is every part of you listening to the voice of God? Now, I want to help you out for a moment because I know when you first give your heart to Jesus and you hear some pastor, preacher, evangelist, or a mature believer who's been walking with the Lord a long time and they say, listen to the conviction of the Spirit of God. Listen to the voice of God. What does that sound like? What does it look like? 
and immature believers who first come into the faith, they're like, I'm praying and I don't hear nothing. You're not going to hear an audible voice, most likely. There's a few exceptions. I'm talking about a general. You're not going to hear an audible voice in your ear. But as you study the Word of God, as you talk to Him, and as you attempt to listen, that's why I like this helmet. Sometimes you've got to hit the button to turn the volume up to be able to hear the person you're speaking to. It's like we're leaning in. We're, we're, we're turning our ear. We're listening to the voice. We, don't, we may not hear it. Folks, when we get saved, it's like God's far off and we're here and we want to get closer. So we're trying to do our best. God doesn't move. He is there. He is right there with us. What happens is we change. The more we study the word of God, and, he, and you know, God says, hide it in your heart. That means study it and put it in your heart. When you pray, you will hear his voice speaking through your heart, bringing to mind what you've read. And then before long, instead of God being way off there and you're way down here, all of a sudden, wham, he's right here and you're here. And when you talk to him, you hear him. When I'm preaching, I hear him. Not audible. I hear him. It's his words, not mine. I follow after him. Sometimes I reveal stuff I don't want to reveal. I, don't, I tell stuff that I don't want to tell because some of that stuff is not for anybody to know. And God says, no, they're going to share that because you're trying to keep it hidden. See, anything that we try to hide, God wants brought out into the open because the enemy can use what we try to hide. The enemy can't use anything we've opened up and revealed. We want to be acceptable to God? Read his word. Look for his guidance. Listen for his guidance. Follow after him, spiritual ear, hearing him, incline our ear toward him. When we do that, and when we're acceptable to God, then look at that last part. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and what? Approved by, approved by believers. Now, this is not men in general. This is believers. It's written to the church. It's written to the believers. Guess what? You stand for God, the lost, are, they're not going to say that you're approved. They're going to put you down. Because they don't believe that your God we serve is the real God. They believe we've made it up. They believe the Bible's a myth. They believe it was written by a man. So they don't understand truth. They're not hearing truth. They're not understanding God's trying to reach them. They're not going to uh, uh, give us any credit for it. But when we are acceptable to God because we're living for him, then we're going to be approved by other men who love, other women who love him within the church. Not just the, our denomination, but within God's Church, look at verse 19 as we close to the end. It says, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may what? Edify one another. Edify means to build up, to encourage. Jesus did that often. When it comes to our convictions, do not focus on the rightness or the wrongness of the liberty that you receive from it. Instead, focus on loving each other. Remember, mature folks are asked to change. Doesn't mean that you... Believe what the weaker believes. It just means in their presence, you don't cause them a difficulty with it. Look at the next part. To the strong believer. Paul is writing now to the strong believer. These verses. Look what he says in verse 20. Do not what? Exactly. There it again. The second time he said, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. That word destroy means to throw down or demolish. It says, all things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. Here it is again. Mature believer, don't offend the weaker by eating in their presence if you know that they have a problem with that. Look at verse 21. It is neither good to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother does what? Stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Three words stressing the importance of the mature believer not to cause an immature believer to fall down or to uh, uh, lose their faith or quit walking. That The bottom line is your liberty to drink, to eat meat, to gamble, to tattoo your body, to pierce your body does. If it causes another to sin, don't flaunt it because then it becomes sin to you. Now, I'll tell you, tattoos, boy, I, you know, growing up with working with teenagers 18 years, they all want to go get tattoos. And, and I grew up with my grandfather. He said, don't get a tattoo. Look at it. It's ugly. It's bad. It's not good. And I said, okay, I'm not going to. Actually, he said, you get a tattoo, I'm going to whoop your butt. But anyway, uh, I said, okay, no problem, no problem. And then as you teach through the Old Testament, see, I studied the Old Testament. When you study the Old Testament, the Old Testament is full of illustrations saying, don't cut your body. Now, the reason people cut their body was to give praise to their pagan gods. Then it says, don't tattoo your bodies making these images because they did it for the dead. That was a form of worship, and they did it for their false gods. It said, don't pierce your body. Don't put these big things in your ears. Don't 
pierce your, your body. Don't do it because it is done to worship false gods. See, I understood that. Therefore, I would not do any of that to my body. But now understand, folks, we live in a different time. That was Old Testament teaching. That was Old Testament law. Now, I personally, I'm not going to, you know, I've used this illustration of many times. How would you have felt this morning if you had came in here and we had a break-in last night and somebody came in here and they broke profanity on all of these pews and they carved them, they knocked them over, they damaged all of this stuff, they busted up our, our, our instruments and they tore up our sound system. How would that make you feel? This is your property, your house. You paid your money to have it. They came in and destroyed our beautiful stained glass with rocks through it. You'd feel pretty bad, wouldn't you? Why? It's just a building made of brick and mortar. It has no value to God. What gives this place value? You. Because you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When you come in, you bring the Spirit of God with you. <coughs> But yet, our temple of the Holy, our temple for the Spirit of God, we have no problem cutting it, marring it, and tattooing it, painting it, decorating it. And yet, the body don't belong to us; it belongs to God. Huh? Is it wrong? It's each individual's conviction. If it's wrong for you, then it's wrong for you. But don't bring your conviction. Onto someone else. Now I'm proud of Change of Gratitude Church. You have been amazing. I mean, when Pastor Adam came, he was all concerned about the tattoos he had on his arm. I said, "Leave your sleeves down, because tattoos don't make you saved. Doesn't keep you from being saved. Doesn't prohibit you from preaching the Word of God. Doesn't prohibit you from living out Christ. Leave them on. Cover them up until you get to know the people and they get to know you. And you know what happened? You fell in love with him because he was a man of God, called of God, preaching the Word of God." You didn't care that he had tattoos on. So then the first outing we went to that was out in Northern Park, he was saying, do I need to wear a long sleeve? And I'm like, it's going to be 90 degrees outside. Don't wear no long sleeve, you know. <laughs> it, 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 but my tattoos, don't worry about it. They either love you or don't. And if that's going to be a source of problem, it's a problem with them, not you. So what happened? Pastor John comes and he says, yeah, but what about my tattoos? I said, it don't matter. These folks are not going to judge you based on the tattoos. You, let them, you can wear a short sleeve. Be yourself. If it ain't right and wrong for you, it ain't wrong for you. If it's wrong for you, then don't. It's wrong for me. I'm not going to do it. But my convictions of not being right for me is not going to be put onto him saying it's not right for him. He needs to go get them removed. No. The Spirit of God convicts us and leads us. We follow him and we live that life out. And it's hard. I mean, Paul had to relearn everything because he was taught all of these things that were wrong that now the Spirit of God said to him, what I call clean, you do not call unclean. And he had to relearn these things. It was tough. He was weak in the faith. But he demonstrated that he became strong in the faith by allowing the Spirit of God to do his job to bring conviction of what's right and wrong for each of us. That's the Spirit of God's job, not ours. Now, that was to the strong believer. Don't cause another to stumble. Don't cause them to be offended. Don't cause them to be made weak. Now to the weak brother. I'm going to give you a hint. He doesn't tell you to change. Look what the weak brother. <laughs> weak in the flesh. Now, this pertains to me in several areas. In, in Romans 14, look to verse 22. Do you have what? Do you have faith? Okay, you're weak in the faith. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before who? God. Before God. Paul does not require the strong to abandon their convictions about these things and condemn it. Uh, instead, he's telling them to be encouraged in faith. Look at the last part of verse 22. It says, happy Everybody wants to be happy in his life, and we live in enough misery. Happy is he who does not condemn who? Here's the problem. We see something wrong in someone else, and we condemn them because we've condemned ourselves already. We don't need to be condemning ourselves. If God's Spirit tells us it's wrong for us, then we need to not do it. And therefore, we will stand before him righteous, at peace. But don't tell them it's wrong for them because it's wrong for you. Gray area, tough area, hard to follow. I've listened to arguments upon arguments upon arguments. Don't be divided over something so ridiculous. What you believe about these things should be kept between you and God. You are fortunate that in your actions you can reveal your doubt about the faith you have in God. Therefore, your actions need to demonstrate your love for God and your love for each other. The lost will see that and say, wow, look at John, he's all tattooed up and that church lets him be an assistant pastor because he's going to become a pastor. 
It must be okay. I must be okay. I can go in there with my tattoo show. See, you've already embraced a group of people that some churches wouldn't even allow in their church. Because they say, oh, no, that's wrong. You, you need to go get that taken care of. We are to love God and love others. Not throw stones and condemn them. The Spirit of God will convict them. To the weak one, you want to be happy? If it's wrong for you, then stay, then don't do it. The last verse in verse 23. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is what? Sin. In other words, it's saying if you've prayed about eating meat, and God says, do not eat meat. If you, because you see a stronger person eat meat, and you decide you're going to eat that meat, you're bringing sin upon yourself because your convictions was that it's wrong. See the problem? You don't feel right about it, then don't do it. That's the bottom line. Chapter 14 is not about Paul trying to change our convictions, but rather us, he's challenging us to seek the Lord with all of who we are and to follow our convictions without placing our convictions upon another. Chapter 14's main focus, the main focus of the whole chapter is summed up in one word unity. <laughs> Chapter 13, the whole chapter summed up in one word, love. 14, chapter 14, when you uh, come to chapter 14, you understand that because of unity, because of keeping peace, because of loving, chapter 13, loving each other, you embrace each other just as they are, and you allow God to change them from the inside. And if God speaks to their heart to change in line with you, then praise the Lord for you. If not, you change your heart to accept what is okay with them. I have people ask me all the time because I hang out with bikers. Bikers are known for their roughness and they're known for their tattoos. Some of them have some amazing works of art. I love art. I can appreciate art. I love our stained glass window. You look at that right now. Isn't it beautiful? The sun's coming through it right now. We can see all of the colors uh, bursting. I love the, I love art. Now, I don't think a body covered in art is very beautiful, but a picture here and there is okay because that's my convictions. God's looking at our heart. I think sometimes our heart is covered up with ungodliness that we don't even hear the Spirit of God. And when we don't hear the Spirit of God, the ungodliness comes across to others as rude and hateful, speech that has not been thought through, arrogance, putting people in their place because they're stupid, more stupid than you. See, when our heart is covered up with sin that we're not embracing who God is and what he's done for us, we will follow after that heart covered in sin after things that are wrong. We won't be in unity. As a matter of fact, we'll bring in division. You know what the Bible says about a brother who brings in division? To shun them, to stay away from them, to cast them out. Chapter 14 is all about unity because of chapter 13, all about love. If we love one another, then we accept one another. We let God bring the conviction, not us. And I'll tell you, it's, it's been rough. It's been hard because I grew up in a day and time where you missed church more than two or three times and you and you needed to be standing before God. You, you were something wrong with you and, and the church needed to call you and tell you you're wrong and you need to get back in church. That's not what the Bible says, though. Our relationship before God is between us and God and no one else. It's not our job to convict them of their wrong. They know it's wrong. Our job is to love them when they're here, embrace them, encourage them. We're going to have some folks that are going to stay away all during this COVID time. They may not ever come back to a church. If they come here and they've been out of church for a year, two, or three, don't ever, ever, ever let me over here. You condemn them for coming. You should be excited to see them. You should be grateful to see them. You should celebrate them being here. You should be so excited. You should go and talk to other people. Hey, did you see so-and-so's here? So-and-so's here, so-and-so here. Everybody should be loving on them. No one should be condemning them. And yet churches across the nation love to condemn. I'm glad you are not one of those because you care about them. And I know from a heart of love, we miss them. And when, we're there, when they show up, we're like, where have you been? Because we miss them. Our heart misses them. But sometimes those words come across as condemnation. We need to be careful how we communicate with each other. Our words are powerful. And if we want to love God, we want him to use us to love each other. And that way, when the lost come in here, they see you loving each other. 
regardless of what you look like, how you dress, what status you are, what level of, of uh, power you have in the community, doesn't matter. You love one another and you welcome them. Some folks, they, they tell us in the statistics that within the first couple minutes of a lost person coming into a church, they've already formed all the opinions they need for that church. What are they going to form about you? Hopefully, prayerfully, you continue to maintain the same, loving them like God loves them. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you love us. We do thank you that you want to communicate with us. We do thank you, just like this helmet was designed, if we put it on to protect us, you have given us your word about unity to protect us as the church so that we can look like the body that loves you, that reflects you, that the lost will see and you have got your protection over us. Because of our love, we can love them. Father, help us who are weak in the faith in so many areas to become strong. And help those that are strong in the area to be more mature by, by protecting, uh, encouraging those that are weaker in the faith. Father, I pray you speak through us as a church to this community that we love them. We care about them. We will welcome them regardless of what's going on in their life. Help us as a church to not try to convict others. We're leaving that up to you. Father, I pray if there's any here today that has been examining their own walk with you. And if they've been failing in that walk, Father, I pray that you would encourage them and, and let them examine whether or not they're connected to a body of believers that they can be encouraged by. Uh, you tell us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together because it brings unity and it brings encouragement and it brings strength. That when we are weak, we can allow our church brothers and sisters to gather around us to help reveal the strength you want to give us through them. Father, I pray that if there's any that have uh, been tuning in today or listening and they've never invited you into their heart, they, they've been involved in church before, their religion, they may have even gone to a Christian school. Or, uh, I pray, Father, you speak to their heart about their heart condition. Is it covered with sin? If it is, ask, allow them to have the courage to ask you to forgive them of that sin, to ask you to come into their life, Father, to change them on the inside to become more like you. Father, I pray for those that may have invited you to their heart. Maybe they've not been baptized and they desire to be baptized. An outward expression of the inward change. Uh, allow them to connect with us that we can help them with that. Father, I pray that as a church, you would help us to love you, follow you, walk with you. Never condone sin, but love everyone that you love. We thank you for the love you've given to us and help us to express that to those that are outside of this church as well as those within the church. We do pray for the many we have sick, Father, especially the ones that have the coronavirus. We pray a healing upon their bodies, Father. We pray your hand of protection around them. We pray, Father, that you'll bless them with their smell coming back and all these things that they've lost, the, the, especially with the headaches and the temperature and the, the pain that they've had to suffer with. We pray that you protect them. Father, we do want to pray as our COVID number starting to go down, we pray that it will continue to go down until it's gone away. And, Father, we pray that we'll be able to get back to having our small group Bible fellowship. We'll get back to having our Wednesday night prayer meeting. Father, time to be with you, an opportunity for people to come to gather for you. We thank you for loving us and using us, believing in us and trusting in us. We ask this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.